What is critical race theory? First of all, let me just make it clear that this video is not meant as a complete description of every single aspect of critical race theory, but as a guide to some of the most common arguments you will come up against when you argue with proponents of said theory. So with that out of the way, let's continue. To answer the question, what is CRT, we first need to know that there are two applications for the term. One is the original meaning, which is a framework for legal scholars to investigate whether certain outcomes in the legal system are due to institutional racism or other factors. It has its roots in Marxist critical theory which looks at power structures and wealth as mechanisms for oppression instead of race as CRT does. Now that doesn't sound like what I hear about in the media you might say, and you'd be right because the term has since taken on a new second meaning. Just like scientists mean a different thing with the word theory than a layman, so does CRT mean different things to a legal scholar and a member of the general public. CRT has in common parlance become an umbrella term for all things woke. And the fact that CRT means something else to legal scholars is probably the first retort you will get when you debate someone on the other side. They will invariably say that you don't know what you're talking about. Remind them of the word theory in scientific versus common speech. Or better yet, use one of their own terms and remind them that the word gender means a different thing on a legal document than it does in gender studies, for instance. On a legal document, it simply means sex. But in gender studies, it means how you express that sex and can have a variety of options other than the legal male or female. Whether they or even you agree, they still have to concede the fact that words can have different meanings in different contexts. So, now that we know a little bit more about the history of the term and that it has two meanings, let's find out what it deals with and what it means in reality when regular people talk about it. Controlling speech our first point actually flows nicely from the introduction. People who espouse critical race theory love to change the meaning of words. This is not the same thing as, let's say, CRT organically taking on a new meaning because people needed a phrase to encompass what they were trying to express. Instead, what I mean here is the top-down application of soft power to force certain terms to either shift meaning or be banned altogether. Think of the singular they, them, and other pronouns. It's not an organic change taking place over decades where people gradually adopt it because it feels natural. Quite the opposite. It's incredibly awkward to use and it's been forced on the population through massive propaganda campaigns and even threats of incarceration in countries like Canada. Just a few months ago, a father was jailed there for using the wrong pronoun when referring to his daughter. The exact thing they said would never happen. With threats and coercion like that, it can hardly be considered a natural and organic shift in language. Another example is the use of person of color. A phrase that was practically unknown 10 years ago has now become the mandatory terminology for all intents and purposes. There are of course many more examples of this, but this is not a list video, so let's continue. I'm sure you get the idea. Of all the points discussed in this video, this one might be the hardest to combat. Speak out against it and in return you'll get, who does it hurt? Or, why do you care? It's just a word. And in the strictest technical sense, they're right. And that's what's so insidious about this. Yes, words won't hurt anyone. But the slow adjustment of common words so that they only align with and validate a certain political view is nevertheless an attack on objectivity and fairness. So how do you combat this? In my assessment, it can only be fought indirectly by making absolutely sure that freedom of speech is never in any way infringed. You can't stop people from using whatever words they want. In fact, you shouldn't want to. Instead, defend free speech, refuse to use the terms you deem biased against your worldview, and make sure no one will ever go to jail in this country for using the wrong terminology. 
oppose any politician, any law, and any person who wants to either compel or prohibit any type of speech. White Privilege White privilege is one of the cornerstones of colloquial CRT as it stands today. It's one of the most important tenets in this neo-religious faith movement and acts almost identically to original sin in other religions, except it applies solely to white people, of course. According to these people, if you're born white, you have unearned privilege that you are powerless to remove, regardless of your socio-economical situation. Even if you're a disabled homeless man, you should always feel shame because there is always a theoretical disabled homeless black man who has it worse. Or so the story goes. Any reasonable person would be able to see that this is utter nonsense, yet here we are. Where a reasonable person might interject that perhaps there are other things such as gang culture that hold people in black neighborhoods down and that those things can and must change for disparities to disappear. White privilege in CRT maintains that the mere existence of white people holds black people down. Opposing this point is easier than most. Just ask them whether they would be okay with you replacing the word white with Jewish. Also ask them to explain how someone who has never had a single break, who has struggled their entire life, never inherited any money or anything, still holds white privilege. They will still want to maintain that he has it, but you'll get some enjoyable squirming as they try to justify that factor. At that point, you can be sure the conversation will pivot. Maybe on to our next category. Reparations Reparations are, as you might deduce, closely related to white privilege. As they believe in this form of original sin, or sins of the father if you will, they naturally want white people to pay for the sins not committed by them, but by their forefathers. They insist that since some white people owned slaves, and mind you a very small percentage of white people did, they amassed wealth and committed horrible crimes, which they did, so therefore white people living today must pay the price. Opposing this is quite simple, but of course don't expect them to publicly change their stance. Start by asking them if they think it's morally correct to make someone pay for a crime they didn't commit to a person that wasn't the victim of said crime. They will undoubtedly declare that black people are still the victim of it. Ask them to justify that and they will no doubt circle right back to white privilege. A circular argument being a fallacy, continue to query them on whether or not they feel it's morally correct to punish innocent people regardless of whether or not there are victims today. Ask them if economic assistance isn't better left to considerations of poverty rather than skin color. Whether or not they agree, you have shifted the discussion to a much more useful and productive position, namely wealth redistribution. Now you yourself may or may not agree with such measures, but the fact is that America has these policies and they aren't going away anytime soon. So framing the problem in that light helps move the discussion into an area that might potentially have real world implications instead of the pie in the sky stuff of reparations. Equity. This is a fairly new addition to this whole buzzword soup. Now we're all familiar with equality, right? The principle that everyone should be treated equally under the law and any public institutions. It's a time-honored and reasonable principle that has served us well and one that I happen to agree with. However, equality doesn't mean that we are equal, only that we should be treated equally. After all, some people are tall, some are short, some are really smart, and some are, well, not so much. You get the idea. We recognize that there are a myriad of differences, some good, some bad, that are our personal responsibility to overcome. To put it simply, it's your job to find out what you're good at. Meanwhile, it's society's job to make sure there are no legal barriers to stop you from finding that thing. As the Declaration of Independence says, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Notice that it says pursuit of happiness, not guarantee of it. This is where equity comes in. 
equity seeks instead of equal treatment, equal outcomes, which is of course the ultimate communist dream. It may sound okay on paper, but is of course as impossible to achieve as turning lead into gold through alchemy, and any attempt at implementing it soon turns to utter tyranny. Or as the saying goes, nice from far, but far from nice. Imagining that you can socially engineer society to such a degree that everyone has an equal outcome is a delusional pipe dream that will never come to pass. And I think most people know this in their heart. Even those who espouse this ideology. To paraphrase George Carlin, think of how stupid the average person is and now realize that half of them are stupider than that. As anyone soon realizes, the only way to achieve equality of outcome or equity is to artificially cripple everyone, both mentally and physically, to reach the lowest common denominator. This is of course impossible in any society you'd like to live in. Proponents will invariably pivot at this time to that it's only a soft goal, not an immutable one. To which I would respond, why would you set an impossible goal? I'm all for setting goals that are almost impossible, that's fine. But setting one that is actually impossible? What's the point of that? Society is much better served by setting goals that are realistic and actually attainable. Label everything. If you're an aspiring Wookie, labels are your friends. It doesn't matter what you label, only that you do it. Label your friends and label your enemies, just as long as it divides people into us versus them. Okay, I'll stop making it sound like a commercial now. Whether they label people as a person of color, non-binary, fascist, cis, or a ham sandwich, the objective is the same, to elevate themselves and dehumanize their opponents. The labels are also there to goad you. Don't fall for it. It's right out of Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. As he says, an enemy who is properly goaded and guided in his reactions will be your major strength. Now don't shoot the messenger, whether or not you agree with Alinsky is immaterial. Instead, take the time to read the book, because you can be sure that many of your opponents have. And it also touches on many of the other points brought up in this video. And if you know the tactic employed, you know how to counter it. history. You have no doubt seen many examples of this. Changing history is quite the pastime for Wokies, especially when it comes to popular culture and books. Whether it's exchanging the race of historical figures or altering events entirely to make contributions of black characters more significant than they were in reality, the reason for this is simply to make themselves feel good and to make history less offensive. The problem with this is that history is not there for you to like or dislike, it's there for you to learn from. And if it offends you, all the better, because then you're less likely to repeat the same mistakes that we've already made. Keeping history exactly as it is, at least that which we know for certain, is a safety feature, an obstacle, however feeble, against letting the evils of the past yet again enter our world. In short, make new stories, write new heroic tales about black people, make movies, plays, and everything in between, I totally support that. Let's forge a better future and not get eternally bogged down in the past, because we know where that leads, war, in one form or another. So let the past simply be an educator along the way, on our quest for a better tomorrow. Microaggressions. I just want to touch on this point briefly. A microaggression is basically a statement or action that is unintentionally perceived as racist. An example of this might be asking a person where they're from. Now a normal person would answer something like Texas or just across town or something. But someone who just can't stop thinking about race will take offense and misinterpret your question as you asking them what country they're from. Now, unless you have a thick accent, in which case asking what country you're from is a valid question, you can rest assured that the person you're talking to is just engaging in regular old small talk. The kind of thing you engage in when you're interested in that person. 
It's not something you do with someone you dislike. So beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, but small talk is just small talk. And if it upsets you, that's a you problem. And it's time to buck up. Conclusion First of all, let me take a second to acknowledge the fact that no one is completely objective. I'm only human, but I've tried to keep the examples in this video to actual retorts I have personally encountered and not made up straw men. And there are no doubt many more points I could have brought up in this video, but I have to draw the line somewhere. Suffice it to say, there are other things to discuss regarding this CRT umbrella term. The progressive stack, BLM, intersectionality, the opposition to colorblindness, professional victimhood, and collectivism, to name a few. But I feel they are a topic for another day. And of course, Marxism could have been a chapter on its own or maybe even its own video. But I think this will serve as a good starting off point, both for you and your upcoming arguments, and for me as the first video of this type. So, give it a like and a share. If it's popular, I'll make more. And on that note, thanks for watching and see you next time.